been talking a lot about the Holy Spirit the last few weeks, and I want us to go a little bit deeper today. Speaking of how great is our God to give us the wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to live inside of us. How great he is. Verse 5, Titus chapter 3, the word of the Lord says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come before your throne of grace today, Father, we come thanking you, Father, for the sweet Holy Spirit. Father, you washed us clean. The regeneration by the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Father, I can't thank you enough for that. Father, that you changed my life, that you have changed others, Father, and you are willing and able to change even more. To anyone who chooses to come to you to repent of sin and to place their trust in your Son, Jesus Christ, as their personal Lord and Savior. So, Father, we trust that you will be about your business today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said, over the last uh, few weeks, we've been talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. Last week from John chapter 16, verse 8 through 14, we, we talked about and discussed how He, the Holy Spirit, is working by convicting of sin, remember, and of righteousness. And you remember that last one? And of judgment, the Bible says. And, and here he is, uh, he's teaching people about Christ, the Bible said, and about glorifying him. Last week in Acts chapter 2, we saw him bringing people to conversion. And I want us to just go a little bit deeper on this topic about what the Holy Spirit is doing at conversion today. Let's consider what the Holy Spirit does at the moment of saving faith. And as we do that, the first thing I want to share with you today is that the Holy Spirit, at the moment of saving faith, he brings new life to the believer. Again, here in our text this morning, in, Ti in Titus chapter 3, what does it say? Verse 5, again, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. In other words, we can never save ourselves, even by the best of our good works. But according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. I think it's important this morning that we recognize that all are spiritually dead because of sin. Before we got saved by his mercy, we were all spiritually dead because of our sin and our trespasses. Ephesians chapter 2. Turn with me there. We're just going to have a good old Bible study today. Ephesians chapter 2. And beginning in verse 1, it says, And you hath he quickened. That word quickened there means made alive. He has made you alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked according to the world of this world, the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. That word conversation there just means our, our conduct in times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. 
and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. A lot of times we hear, well, we're all children of God, right? That's not biblical. We're not all children of God. Jesus looked at the most religious sect of the day, the Pharisees, and he said, you guys are vipers. You are of your father, the devil. Here it says we were all children of wrath, not children of God. But what we'll see is how to become a child of God. It says in John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received, received what? Him. To them gave he the power to be the sons of God. Are you with me? Amen. We are not a child of God until we receive Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Now, we were all made in his image. That's the correct thing. We were all made in his image, but until we're born again, we're not in the family of God. Let's continue reading there. In verse 4 again, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, there it is again, hath quickened us or made us alive together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is, the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith. That not, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. In other words, you're not saved by your good works. You're saved by grace, but you are saved to do good works. Amen? Amen? When the Holy Spirit moves into your life, He's going to change your heart. He's going to change your life to where we will want to do those good works that has already been ordained for God by, before the foundation of the world for God, for us. From God for us. So all are spiritually dead because of sin until they come to Christ. Remember Nicodemus and Jesus in John chapter 3. We've talked about that a few times. Uh, as I said, Nicodemus was one of those of the most religious sect, but he was lost. He needed a spiritual birth, Jesus told him. And he told him apart from that new birth, he would not be saved. He's going to stay dead in his sin. And in Titus chapter 3, verse 5, that word regeneration there that we read, it means new birth. It said the washing of regeneration or the washing of a new birth, it says, and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's the Holy Spirit of God that does that in your life and in my life when we come to Christ Jesus. I mean, most have yearned to be able to start life over again. Would you agree with that this morning? Hello? <laughs> I don't think there's a one of us in here that doesn't desire a fresh start. A new start, and God wants to give us that. He's saying here, in the sight of God, through Jesus Christ, we can have just that. Amen? Amen. New life. How amazing is that? And then next, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in the believer. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians. We're just having a good old doctrinal lesson today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
Look at verse 19 and 20 there. Chapter 6, verse 19 and 20. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? We've been bought with a price, right? We are not our own. If the Holy, if we are saved through Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost now lives within us. And the Bible says here that our body is the temple, the residence, if you will, of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Verse 20. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are whose? God's. This generation that says my body is my own. They got trouble with God, don't they? That's not what God says. If you claim to be born again, that is. You're not your own to do with with your body as you choose to do with. God's the owner. So much so that the Holy Spirit has come and taken residence inside of you. I think about that and I think about a lot of times how we say, you know, we, we may go do something that doesn't exactly line up with God's will. We may go somewhere, you know, go watch that filthy movie, you know. Pull out that magazine we have no business pulling out. Just going somewhere that we have no place going. And we think it's okay. And a lot of times we say something like, you know, or, or, or somebody may say something to us like this. Well, you don't need to be going somewhere that, you know, God can't go with you. Right? <laughs> It's the wrong thing to say according to that. Because what this says is God goes everywhere we go. In other words, you're taking God into that place with you. It's not like he's stopping at the entrance door while you go in. Right? It's not like he's living the, leaving the living room and going in the kitchen while you open the book. He is in you. You take him everywhere you go. Remember we talked about grieving the Holy Spirit last couple of weeks. You want to know if God's disappointed, if God's hurt when you take him in with you? You're grieving the Holy Spirit. It hurts. I think it was Heather when she was with us, I think, when she sang that song, Does He Still Feel the Nails? Every time I fail, does he hear the crowd cry, crucify again? Friends, it's important this morning that we realize that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, that this body is his residence, his temple. And as I think about when the Holy Spirit comes in, that, that there's evidence of that, you know? And listen, Jesus promised this to his disciples in John 14 in verse 16 through 23. He said there in verse 16, he's sending the comforter so that he may abide with you forever. Verse 17, but ye know him for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. And friends, when the Holy Spirit comes in, I mean, there's evidence of him occupying the believer's life. First of all, one of the evidence, I think, this Bible right here, this book becomes a new book in our life. You see, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he will open this book up to you. I always recommend folks, say a, say a prayer before you open God's Word. 
Holy Spirit, reveal to me what you want to reveal to me today. Show me what you want to show. You know what will happen? He will do it. There will be things in this book you did not understand before you became a Christian that just because the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, He will show them to you. And He will help you understand. You will desire the Bible. You know what else a new believer that's been changed in Christ will desire? You will desire the body. The fellowship. I'm telling you, Christ is truly living inside of you. You will miss church. <laughs> if you're not missing church and if you're not desiring the Bible, you have reason to doubt. Because if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, He will be doing His job. Does everybody believe that? Amen. He's not going to let you down. He's not going to let the Father and the Son down. He is going to be doing His job, convicting us of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. You'll desire the book. You'll desire the body. You will desire baptism. If you've never done that, if the Holy Spirit's truly living inside of you. Not only that, something else that's going to be evidence in the occupant of the believer's life, the fruit of the Spirit starts showing up in your life. If the Holy Spirit's living inside of you, you know what other people are going to start seeing through you? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meaning patience. Faith, all of those nine fruits of the Spirit, people are going to be seeing in your life. I can't help it, folks. Today we have to realize there really is change if the Holy Spirit moves in. If there's no change in your life, there's reason to doubt. Because He's going to be doing His job. And there's just going to be a new longing, you know, for holy living. It's going to become a part of your life. Not only that, power to overcome sin is going to be your daily experience. <laughs> That's just who God is. He's going to do His work. He's going to keep His promises. So He brings new life. He indwells within us. And also, you know what else happens? The Holy Spirit seals the believer. The Holy Spirit seals the believer, number three. If you go back in Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. <coughs> And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit seals the book. Note the thrilling process there. Regeneration, residence, sealing. Sealing just speaks of ownership. Think, I don't know... Uh, Think of the title of your car. The title declares who owns that car, right? You know, some of you own your car. A lot of us, the bank owns our car. <laughs> but the title declares who owns the car. Or, or maybe just think of your marriage license. It, it, it says who you're married to. Or maybe a better word there is who you're committed to, right? When you and I are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, it's saying, again, God is the owner of this body. God owns me, but it not only says that, it says that God is committed to me. He is committed to finishing the work in me that he said that he was going to do. 
He seals us. So the presence of the Holy Spirit within the believer, it's kind of like a down payment. That may be a good word for it there. Go, go back to Ephesians chapter 1. A few pages back to Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 13 and 14. I'll even read verse 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed. Are you with me? It's happening at conversion, right? After that ye believed. Ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest. That's where I come up with that word down payment. That's really what that means. Earnest, okay? Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. We are sealed until the day of redemption. Like a down payment. God says, hey, I'm going to save you. <laughs> and I'm going to give you some earnest on that. I'm going to give you the gift, the earnest of the Holy Spirit of God. To prove to you, to show you that I have you. That I've got you back. I own you. I can sustain you. And I will complete the process and bring you home on the day of redemption. Here's the promise. The seal of the Holy Spirit on you. What a great God we serve. And to guarantee this sealing, we have the witness of the Holy Spirit. I want to look over in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 to show you that this morning. Romans chapter 8. Verse 14 through 16. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Did it say everybody's a child of God there? Another evidence, right? Who are sons of God? Those that are led by the Spirit of God. For ye are not received, that you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba Father. You are no longer a slave to Satan, a slave of any kind. You have received the spirit of adoption. <clears throat> can look at God now and call him Father. What a term of endearment. Amen. Abba Father. It really goes deeper than Father. It really goes on to say Daddy. Verse 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So it says we've got the witness of the Holy Spirit in us. And when we're out and about, people will see that in us. The sealing of the Spirit guarantees that what God has begun, He's going to continue to completion. Remember, you're sealed until the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit seals the believer, but not only that, one more. What else does he do? The Holy Spirit baptizes the believer. He baptizes the believer. For that, we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians. Chapter 12 this time. 
In verse 13. The Lord here is explaining what it means to be in the body of Christ. He's talking about the spiritual gifts that are in the body of Christ. And he's talking about how not one spiritual gift is any greater than the other. You know? For instance, my spiritual gift may be the mouth today. You know? Your spiritual gift may be the hand. You know, you have the spiritual gift of helps. The Bible is saying that I cannot say to you, I don't need you. <laughs> He's saying that the guy that cleans the toilets, the guy that unlocks the doors is more important or at least as important as the preacher. We all need each other to make up the body of Christ. Without one of us, we're handicapped. Do you understand that today? If you're the hand of the church, whatever your gift is, the eye, the ears, the hands, whatever, let's say you're the hand of the church. If the hand is not here, what do you call a person without a hand? Handicap, right? God is saying if you're a part of the body of Christ, you are so important to the body of Christ. Guess what? When you're not there, the rest of them are handicapped. Do you realize that today? If you're not in your place at the body of Christ, we are not who we are called to be. We are not our best. Does that make sense? We're handicapped. We all need each other. But let's look at chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. We've all been made to drink into one spirit. It goes on, for the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Of course, the obvious answer is no. And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Again, obvious answer, no. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole body were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it hath, what church was it say, pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor gain the head, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And these members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. God put you here for a reason, friend. We all need each other. Nobody's more important than anybody else. I need you today. I need you today. The Bible says the Holy Spirit baptized us into one body. 
when we got saved. And that's, it's important to note that it takes place at conversion. You know, and also the following facts, they need to be noted about the baptism of the Spirit. Remember that all references of, of baptism of the Spirit before Pentecost are prophetic. Okay? All references to baptism of the Spirit after Pentecost speak of it as something that happened in the believer's life at conversion. And also, it's important to know that there's no scripture that teaches us to seek the baptism of the Spirit. And I say that because there's many domination, denominations out there that says it's like two different acts. You get saved and then somewhere down the road, you, you know, you get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Or if you don't have this certain gift, you're not baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not according to God. God says when we are saved, the Holy Spirit immediately comes in and takes up residence. And he immediately baptizes us in the one spirit, in the one body, immediately. He baptizes us into a new bond of fellowship. Now part of the family of God. We have a father. We have a daddy. If you're born again and you're saved today, can I just say welcome to the family of God? You were immediately baptized with the Holy Spirit. Into the family. You know the old song. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed by the fountain, saved by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. Or a part of the family, the family of God. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, welcome. You've been baptized with the Holy Spirit into the family of God. New life. You're indwelt, you're sealed, you're baptized. All at conversion. And friends, in view of these benefits in Christ, I want to encourage you this morning, let us walk in the Spirit. Amen? Let's walk in the Spirit because we are equipped to win. Aren't you glad? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Comforter, the Helper, Father, the one who has given his new life, the one who has baptized us into the family of God, the one who has sealed us into the day of redemption. Father, we thank you that he is our guarantee that we are a child of God, that we belong to the family. And Father, we thank you so much for that down payment in our life. And Father, as he helps us along on this side of glory, Father, we look forward to bringing you honor and to bring you glory, which is his purpose. And so, Father, as we walk in the spirit today, Father, just help us to be obedient to whatever he's calling us to do. Father, I realize to some to walk in the Spirit today may be to be saved, to be regenerated. And if the Holy Spirit is calling anyone here today to do that, Father, I pray that they will be obedient.
And Father, they'll repent of their sins and they'll come share that with the family of God. They'll walk this aisle when we begin to sing to make that public confession before men as your Bible commanded us to do. And Father, today I realize that walking in the Spirit may mean that possibly some have turned to the flesh. Some things have just come into their life. Father, today, Father, they just need for you. Father, they just need to rededicate. The Holy Spirit's just calling them to get back in fellowship with you. Father, perhaps today there's just someone here that just, again, needs your comfort. Something's going on in their life, Father. We may not know what it is, but you do. Father, they just need you today as their helper and their comforter. Father, we just pray that whatever the needs today, we thank you for being the provider, the one who is able. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.